Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started uh, so that we can actually get out in time for lunch. Uh, so our next speaker today uh, is Dr. Rishi Agrawal, who's coming to us from Chicago. He's going to continue on our lung cancer theme and talk with us about lung cancer staging. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go over a whirlwind tour of lung cancer staging, specifically the eighth edition of TNM staging. Okay. Uh, this is the roadmap that we're going to go over today. I'm going to do a brief introduction about staging in general. Then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the T part of TNM staging, so tumor. Uh, not so much on node. We had a beautiful introduction about nodes. And then METs, then putting it all together. Okay. So staging is just a way to categorize the extent of disease. Probably the best known example is cancer, but there's staging systems for many other disease processes. And there's many different purposes of staging, but probably the most important one for us as radiologists is that it's a shorthand way to communicate disease extent. And oftentimes as radiologists, we're siloed in our reading rooms, and so if we can speak the same language as our referring clinicians, then that'll go a long way to enhance the communication with them. Second, it's used to guide treatment. Of course, it doesn't tell us everything about lung cancer. It doesn't tell us about cancer genetics, for example. But it's a good starting point, and specifically to tell whether or not surgery is indicated or not. And then third, it's used to estimate prognosis. So these are some survival curves for patients with lung cancer. And you can see that as you increase in the stage, there's a decrease in survival. So there's a real world implication of having an increased stage. And then finally, it aids in research. So you should know the difference between clinical staging and pathologic staging. So clinical staging includes all of the information that's obtained up to the primary tumor resection. And probably the biggest one for us is imaging, but also the physical exam, biopsies, and labs play a role in clinical staging. And then when the primary tumor is resected, that information is combined with the clinical stage to get the pathologic stage, which means that if a patient's treatment plan doesn't include removal of the primary tumor, then they will only get clinical staging. Okay, so let's delve into tumor. The two components of the T category are size and location. And this is how it breaks down. So it's really easy to remember. Each centimeter increase in size from one to five centimeters gets its own T category. And then five to seven is T3 and seven plus is T4. And then T1 is divided into A, B, and C. And then T2 is divided into A and B. And the way I drew these numbers, 1.0 goes to T1A and 1.1 goes to T1B. Okay. So it's important to know how to measure the tumor. So we just take the single longest axis, which is different from how we measure things in lung rads, which we take the mean of the long axis and the orthogonal axis. So for TNM staging, single longest axis. And then it's important to use all your views. So if the tumor is biggest on the sagittals, then use the sagittals to report the measurement. So for example, this tumor was 18 millimeters on the axials, but it was 23 millimeters on the sagittals, which bumps it up to a T category. And then it's important to use your lung recons and windows. So a lot of times these nodules are going to be spiculated. So those spiculations will volume average with lung. And if you use the soft tissue windows, you can underestimate the size of the actual tumor. And then finally, for lesions that have a ground glass and solid component, it's important to measure the whole lesion, but only the solid component goes towards the T category. So for example, here's a patient who had a right upper load tumor, and you might say, well, this is 14 millimeters, which would make it a T1B. But in fact, the, eight, the solid component is only eight millimeters, which makes it a T1A. The other reason why you want to measure the solid component is because if you only measure the entire lesion, it can lead to a false sense that a lesion is not growing. So this same lesion six months earlier was the same size in overall dimension, but when we look at the solid component, you could see that it increased from five to eight millimeters, which is significant. 
Okay, so that's size. Here's how it breaks down by location. And there's a lot of information here, but I'm gonna try to break it down for you into chunks to hopefully make it a little bit more um, easy to digest. So a T1 lesion is a tumor that's surrounded by lung or visceral pleura. It's just like a tumor sitting in the lung, okay, in the middle of the lung, and it can touch the pleura, but it can't invade it. A T2 lesion invades the visceral pleura, a T3 lesion invades the parietal pleura and chest wall, or chest wall. A T4 lesion invades the mediastinum, diaphragm, or spine. Okay, so T2, visceral pleura. T3, parietal pleura, chest wall. T4, mediastinum, spine, diaphragm. And there's a, some, a, a few additional details I'll go into. So here's an example of a T1 lesion. Just a nodule sitting out a, around a sea of lung. Now I mentioned that it, they can touch the pleura, but they can't invade the pleura. So here's a nodule that touches the pleura, but from a radiologic perspective, there's nothing here that I can say that will tell me that this actually invades the pleura, and that's up for a pathologist to say. A T2 lesion, so greater than three centimeters, less than or equal to five centimeters, and remember it invades the visceral pleura or main bronchus, and it also causes atelectasis or pneumonitis of a lung, a lobe, or part of a lobe, okay? So this is a lesion here that's T2 by size criteria. It touches the visceral pleura. But take a look at this case. So here's a lesion that would be a T1 lesion by size criteria at 28 millimeters. But if we look at the sagittal images, you could see that there's, it not only touches the pleura here, but there's spiculation on the other side of the pleura. That, for me, tells me that this is invading the pleura, because by definition, if a nodule goes from one lobe directly invades into another lobe, then that is invasion of the pleura, because remember, uh, the visceral pleura, because remember, the fissures are made up of visceral pleura. Now, if this nodule had a smooth border on the other side, and it merely pushed the, pushed the pleura, then that's not enough evidence to for a radiologist to say that that actually invades the pleura, you would need a pathologist to tell you that. And here's another example of a T2 tumor. So we have a hyalur lesion here, it's 26 millimeters, which would make it a T1, but it got bumped up because if you scroll lower down, there's atelectasis in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe. Okay, a T3 lesion is greater than five centimeters or less than and equal to seven centimeters, and it invades the parietal pleura or chest wall, and it invades the phrenic nerve. So the phrenic nerve runs in the mediastinal parietal pleura, okay? So that's why phrenic nerve goes with T3. Um, and then you can have a separate nodule in the same lobe. So here's a T3 lesion that's 54 millimeters. That would be a T3 lesion by size criteria. But take a look at this lesion. It's 47 millimeters, which would make it a T2. But if we scroll down further, you could see that there's another nodule in the same lobe, which would make it up a T3. Okay, and it's important to distinguish what we're talking about here. A lesion that I just showed you, that is considered an intrapulmonary metastasis, which is an additional nodule with the same histopathologic type as the primary lesion. You should know that TNM, uh, that TNM treats uh, lung cancers with multiple lesions differently. So a patient with additional primary tumors, multiple, multifocal ground glass adenocarcinoma, and diffuse mnemonic type adenocarcinomas, there's slightly different rules for these types of tumors, which we're not going to go into. But what I just showed you would be considered an intrapulmonary metastasis. Okay, and here's a lesion with chest wall invasion. So it's 47 millimeters by size criteria, but you could see that the soft tissue goes all the way up to the bone and the intercostal muscle. Okay, so that would be enough evidence for me to say that this is, has chest wall invasion. Now compare that to the, to the case that I showed you just a second ago, in which the lesion touched the pleura, but we weren't sure whether it invaded the pleura. Here you could see that there's a very thin fat plane between the lesion and the bone and intercostal muscle. So again, this may invade the chest wall, but I can't say that. A pathologist has to make that determination. <laughs> 
Okay, and here's another patient uh, with phrenic nerve invasion. So the phrenic nerve, as I mentioned, runs along the parietal pleura of the mediastinum. And if you look at the chest x-ray, you can guess that there's phrenic nerve invasion because we have elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. All right, and finally, a T4 lesion. So a T4 lesion is greater than seven centimeters, and it is a separate nodule in a different lobe of the same lung, an invasion of the mediastinum, including the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so the recurrent laryngeal nerve is different from the phrenic nerve because the recurrent laryngeal nerve is way deep in the mediastinum. Remember, it loops over under the uh, arch on, on the left side and the subclavian artery on the right side. So that's why re recurrent laryngeal nerve goes in T4 and the phrenic nerve goes in T3. Or it invades the diaphragm and spine. So this is a lesion that's 10 centimeters, which would make it a T4 by size criteria. But take a look at this lesion. It's 41 millimeters, so relatively smaller. But when we scroll down, you could see that there's another nodule in a different lobe. So that would make it a T4. Here's another lesion, so 58 millimeters, by, so T3 by size criteria, but it invades the mediastinal fat right next to the aortic arch, which would make it a T4. And then here's a lesion that invades the spine. It's already a T4 by size criteria, but the spinal invasion is another criteria that, that tells you that. Okay. Um, we heard a little bit about uh, carcinoma in situ and minimally invasive adenocarcinoma already. The only thing I'll say about these is these have a special T category where TIS tends to be a purely ground glass nodule and a T1MI tends to be a nodule with a solid small component. Okay. Um, we already had a beautiful discussion about the, uh, the nodal staging and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just skip over this part here. And finally, metastases. So uh, the M category, um, it goes uh, by M0 or M1, where M0 is no metastatic disease. M1A is intrathoracic mets, and so that can be in the contralateral lung, the pleura, or the pericardium. M1B is a single lesion in a single organ. And then M1C is multiple lesions in one or more organs. So M0, again, no metastatic disease. M1A is considered intrathoracic metastases. And if you look at the sagittal images, um, I find that the sagittals are very good for looking at the pleura, specifically for looking at the fissures. So in this patient, you could see that there's nodular studding of the fissures, the minor fissure and the major fissure here, which tells you that there's uh, pleural metastatic disease. And any time you have a patient with pericardial effusion, you should look very closely to see if there's studding of the pericardium by nodules. So in this case, there's nodular studding of the pericardium, which indicates M1A disease. M1B is a single, a single lesion in a single organ. This is also called oligometastatic disease. So in this patient, there was a tumor in the left upper lobe, which I'm not showing you, and there is a single lesion in the liver here. And then finally, M1C is multiple lesions in one or more organs. So when we put it all together, we take a table like this and we take what we've found on the T, the N, and the M category, and we figure out what the stage is. So I'm just gonna break this down slightly um, with some of the more common things that I think that you should know. I think you should know which patients are surgical candidates. So patients without mediastinal lymph nodes and tumors less than seven centimeters are surgical candidates. So that would be N0 and N1. Um, patients with particularly small tumors, so tumors that are two centimeters or less, segmentectomy is generally preferred over a whole lobectomy when the tumors are that small. The patients that are non-surgical are those with contralateral mediastinal or supraclavicular nodes, patients with metastatic disease, so that would be the M1s, and then patients with larger tumors, T4 tumors and mediastinal lymph nodes. And then the ones that are taken on a case-by-case -case basis. So the larger tumors, the T4 tumors, may be resectable in select cases, but patients typically will undergo preoperative chemotherapy plus or minus radiation. And then patients with ipsilateral mediastinal lymph nodes are generally considered candidates for surgical resection, but they too will typically undergo chemo and radiation. 
And then finally, a word about oligometastatic disease. So for the purposes of TNM staging, oligometastatic disease is defined as one single lesion in one organ. But in clinical practice, people use the term oligometastatic disease. The definition is variable, but generally, they, they use the term when there's five or less metastatic lesions throughout the body. And the reason why we talk about these separately is because these, le these patients tend to be treated more aggressively with local ablative therapy for those individual metastases. Thank you, that's it.